This is something I wrote, uh, gosh, 30-something years ago. It's about the original gangsters uh, of New York. If you saw the film Gangs of New York, it's uh, based on those guys. In this case, it's uh, we're going to talk about a guy named Old Smoke Morrissey, who was really, you know, incredible. He will never see the likes of a guy like him again. Uh, in his day, he was 350 pounds, probably more. He had a broken fist. He had been a, a fighter for so long, his fists were just broken. He could barely use his hands toward the end of his life. His face was scarred badly from these fights. Uh, his grammar was god-awful. He was base. Uh, he was, I think, the best example of uh, Tammany Hall's just outrageous experiments to control uh, p groups politically, in this case the Irish immigrants, and, and their mismanagement of the city. Tammany was a Democrat organization that ruled over New York until well, well, the 1950s, really. Could, could kind of shush that out into the 60s. But, and, and they were we just, corruption was just a way of life with these guys. Um, Tammany was an Indian, and there was a hall called Tammany's Hall, and that's where they met originally. Um, anyway, so Morrissey uh, came to U.S. when he was a baby. His father was a day laborer. Morrissey was 12 years old. He had to go to work in a wallpaper factory. If he was paid at all there, he made like a buck a day. If I don't think he made even that. This is a typical childhood experience for, in, uh, for the poor, very, very poor. They were exploited. They were... Poverty sucked the life out of them. And they, not only for the Irish, but later on for the Italians, who had a little bit worse because they didn't speak English and couldn't generally and, and found it hard to go to the authorities or anybody to get help. Anyway, by age 17, he's now a big, huge guy, way over six feet, a lot of weight. He's a bouncer at night in a bar, and he's a cargo handler during the day. And from the cargo thing, he became one of the best cargo thieves in the city. So if you wanted to, you could hire him. He was a specialist. If you wanted to say, I don't know, they had hammers coming in from England, he would steal your hammers. There's a lot of products coming in and he would steal whatever it was you specifically wanted. The Irish crime bosses who ran the, the docks, they see this oversized guy. So they said, look, you know, you're an enforcer for us because they had gamblers. So you need to collect for us. From there, he graduated to something that was called the land shark, probably the more despicable type uh, here. Land sharks were, uh, at that time, immigrants came into a place called Something Gardens. I can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. but And that's where they came in. And it wasn't a big deal. They get off the boat, somebody talked to them, and off they went. These people had no idea what the hell they were doing. They were from the west of Ireland at first in those days. They were rural people. A lot of them had never seen a building with three floors, three stories. They didn't know it. They were innocent, really. Uh, and they're arriving in New York. And New York was still a large city even back then. They they weren't prepared. And so these land sharks, and there were a lot of them, were around the gardens. And they'd tell the people, oh, come on, I'll escort you down to a, a church and you can get some help. And of course, they'd either just knock them out and steal what they had. Girls are forced into prostitution. Um, they ran boarding houses, which are cited as whorehouses. And they tell these people, you would had to sleep in a room with four or five other immigrants. And they charged top dollar. They didn't know. These people didn't. They thought, well, that, it's expensive to be in America. Or so, so they were horrible. At one point, the police came in heavily armed. They were under a lot of pressure from the Catholic Church to do something. So they came in with rifles and they tried to get these and it was a riot for control of the sidewalks of the garden. Uh, and fences were put up and these people were eventually protected from these land sharks. Land sharks sued, believe it or not. They actually put their money together, got a lawyer and they sued. They lost the suit. But they, they were a despicable group. So anyway, at 19, Morrissey gets tired of fighting for free and he becomes a prize fighter. He gets his name Old Smoke. Nah, old smoke more. Is this true? I don't know. He was in a prize fight in upstate New York. In those days, there were stoves, you know, in every house, every business, the coal stoves, wood stoves. And he, so it says, got knocked into a coal stove. His shirt tails caught fire. And he didn't stop fighting. He just kept swinging until he knocked out his opponent. That's the story. 
Anyway, in 1853, he's 22 years old. He won what was then recognized as the World Heavyweight Championship from Yankee Sullivan, who was this Liverpool-born Irishman. Morrissey paid a price, though. Uh, it was 37 rounds. Bear in mind now, uh, this Yankee Sullivan, he'd been around for a long time. He was considerably older than Morrissey. He'd been in a lot of fights. And he was ugly and he was mean. Uh, in 37 rounds that they went, Morrissey hit the ground a lot. He got knocked down a lot. He was a bloody mess. His face in this fight was cut for life. Uh, his nose was flat, broken. Um, it changed his appearance for the rest of his life. So despite this, this, this thing of him being the world-class pugilist, he was, at this point, another Bowery drunk, you know, just a, a derelict. Uh, yeah, okay, he's a deadly one, but that's he wasn't much more than that. Uh, he was run by this guy called John Kennedy. Kennedy was a thief on a massive scale. Uh, Tammany, he was a Tammany crony. And they, incredibly, appointed him police commissioner. And then a strange twist of faith, uh, he was killed during the New York City draft rights, more than probably by Irish people that he commanded. Uh, Kennedy was the draft riots, uh, you know, it's a, well, it's a long story. But anyway, the draft rights, yeah, you could buy your way out of the draft in those days if you had the money, as long as you found somebody to take your place. And you could go to these desperate poor people and say, here's 20 bucks, a lot of money. You go in my place. And of course, they, didn't, they couldn't buy their way out of it. It wasn't fair. Some of it was racial. It's true. The Irish immigrants were losing work to the blacks that were coming up from the south and would under, undercut them on prices. So there was that. But anyway, they eventually killed Kennedy. Despite the fact that he was sort of a scumbag, Kennedy uh, did well for himself in, during the draft riots. He really was brave. He went out on horseback and he tried to uh, regain the streets for law and order. But so a year after Morrissey won this title, world heavyweight title, which was more like, wasn't actually recognized. There was no title per se. People just saw it that way. Uh, later on, they realized we can make a lot of money by organizing boxing. And so you came up with these titles. His reputation uh, hurt a little bit. One day he had gone up to uh, a bar room and there was this 120 pound thug named Billy Mulligan. Uh, he, Mulligan was uh, sponsored by the anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, no nothing party. There was a fight and he ended up chasing Mulligan out of the bar. Mulligan eventually wandered out west to San Francisco where the no nothings were really strong. In that case, it was the Chinese they had a problem with. He became a deputy sheriff under uh, Dave Scannell, a former member of the Bowery Boys uh, and a saloon keeper out there in San Francisco. And under Scandal's control, Mulligan's chief duty was to control the voting polls. And when there was no voting going on, he ran prostitution out there. Still, you know, Morrissey, despite all that, was he was an important player for, for Tammany, yeah? Because he could, if needed, he could get Irish thugs uh, to go into battle, street battles, against the growing power of the know-nothings. In New York, they didn't know nothing to call the Lone Oak Club. And they were underwritten by this weird guy, a really eccentric man, George Law. Uh, Law wanted to be the know nothings presidential candidate. It, you know, they came close. They controlled seven, they won a lot of gubernatorial races. They won a lot of big city mayor races, state senates. Um, so they're being president. They came close to running a guy for president. Uh, Anyway, Law was, he was victive, he was ruthless, he was uh, petty. He was a second generation Ulster Irishman, Ulster Irish American. In other words, he was a Protestant, for lack of a... Uh, but, you know, he did well for himself. He had, his first job was as a cow manure, bag packer, and he became one of the wealthiest men in the world, a robber baron by definition. In 1847, he tried to take over Nicaragua, he wanted to underwrite U.S. warships. He did underwrite U.S. warships. They attacked the central city down there in Greytown. And he, in exchange, was granted uh, exclusive rights to all U.S. mails that ran through Central America as long as it came by via steamship, which was, as far as I know, the only way to get it. So 
he wasn't content with that. He decided he'd take over all of Central America, which was pretty much more or less owned by the Vanderbilts, the Vanderbilt family, a banking family. There were a lot of peeping matches between these two guys. Um, he made a play for steamship control of this really lucrative Panama, California line. Uh, you wanted to have that because at that time, these robber barons were going into these countries, these little countries, some of them weren't even kind of territories, and just taking gold and silver and, oh, my God, all these wonderful, and bringing them to the U.S. So it was some, it was a, an area you wanted to control. Anyway, uh, Law didn't do too well. The Vanderbilts were sneaker and he was. But what he did was he went back to New York and he got, tro got control of the, of the ferry system. And it was important, you know, to get across to the various islands uh, in New York. And the Vanderbilts were pissed. They said, look, you know, we paid you. He went to Tammany. He said, we paid you good, honest money, uh, bribes. What's going on? And they said, that's true. You did pay us bribes. We didn't ask. Uh, we have nothing to do with the ferry system. Uh, that is owned by the state government, not us. Not my problem. So a lesson learned, huh? <clears throat> anyway... He, at one point, a guy who worked for law was spreading gossip about the governor general of Cuba. Uh, and the governor general got word of that, and he said, you know, if you bring your ships in here, I'm going to take them in retaliation. So, and, and, and in fact, don't come here at all. So Law just wouldn't leave it alone, and he stupidly went to Miller Fillmore, who was the president. Fillmore had been a know-nothing candidate prior to being elected. Uh, and he was a, a bigot and Catholic hater, but on the other hand, I, I have to say, I think Fillmore was just a, you know, he was just a, a politician. He didn't really give a damn one way or the other. He was like her. He could, in fact, there's something written I read where he once called later, the, he called the Irish his uh, most beloved voter or something like that. So anyway, Fillmore said, no, I'm not going to get involved here. I'm not going to get in a war because you had an argument with somebody. So Law grabs this and he sees his opportunity and he says, this is a national issue. This is our national honor. They won't let a, a, our boats in there. We've got to do something, blah, blah, blah. Well, he really caused a stink over there. And one of the things he did uh, to get the voters behind it is he went to New York and he made that his power base and he formed what I just told you. Instead of the know-nothings, which were becoming a little less powerful, he renames what's going on with the law and his money being spread around the city. And he sees this Lone Oak Club growing. It's now in the hundreds of memberships and he's financing that. And he's getting a little too powerful, and they, they get nervous. So they want to close down. The boss of the team, and they, they call in Morrissey. He's not the brightest bulb in the closet. And they say, look, round up several hundred gangsters, we'll pay for it, and shut it down. Well, what he did, he's more ego than brains. Morrissey holds a press conference, of all things. And he says, by the way, Tammany's paying me, and I'm going to go beat up all these guys. And it was a nightmare. So... Uh, for Tammany. So Law, of course, listens to this, and he, he goes to uh, Isaac Ryder's, Reidner's Park Street Club, and he hires their thugs. Then he goes to the Know Nothings, which were a gang called the Plug Uglies, uh, and heading the Plug Uglies was Big Bill Poole. He was considered the deadliest man in all of very deadly Bowery. So he combines these two into his own private army, and he makes him part of the Lone Oak Club. Well, Poole ran his own gang of killers, uh, like an elite corps called the Atlantic Guards. Um, by the way, it, to be in it, you had to be able to throw a butcher's knife through an inch-thick pine plank at 20 feet. Poole himself preferred knife fights over a gun. He was known for biting off his opponent's ears uh, and their noses. Uh, he would also cut out their eyes and kick off their testicles. He wore hobnail boots. They weren't nails, they were knives in his boots, and he would kick them in the groin. So he specialized in burning ballot boxes too. That's what he was really good at, uh, especially against Tammany candidates who he hated, not out of any ideology, but rather because they were they represented 
all the things he didn't like, uh, Catholics and Irish and immigrants and so forth. One day, after right after the press conference, Poole and his guys, they walk into the Park Street Club, and who's there but Morrissey and a couple of his guys? Well, they beat him up. His guys run away, and they leave Morrissey there. They begin to basically beat Morrissey to death. The fact that they didn't kill him was a professional thug oversight, really. Uh, they would live to regret that they didn't kill him. Three months later, Morrissey could walk again. The beating was that bad. Tammany says, look, go to a specific district and guard these voting booths, which we hear uh, they're going to try to run over. So he arrives with his guys several hours earlier. He sets up a stockade. He gets rocks and sticks, broken glasses. He's ready for battle. Uh, if and when the know-nothings in pool show up. Well, they did show up, led by Big Pool himself. Uh, so this time, Poole was caught completely off guard, and he's forced to retreat. They beat him mercilessly. So he's Tammany's very pleased at this point with, with uh, Morrissey, and they give him his own gambling den to, to uh, have a franchise, and he can start his long career as a gambler. But by now, the newspapers, uh, New York had dozens of them back then, they've turned this battle into a personal fight between... Old Smoke Morrissey and Big Bill Poole, who it wasn't really personal between them. But anyway, they started to believe their own press clippings because the newspapers would make them into these bigger-than-life monsters. So in the case of Morrissey, Big Poole was the smart of the two. Uh, in the case of Morrissey, he was blessed with more guts than brains. In January 1855, he challenges Poole to a fight to the death, and he's going to hold it in... Uh, Poole's own stronghold, Christopher Street, the wharf on Christopher Street. Morrissey provides a date and a time when he'll be there. He says he'll be there alone. Well, you know, Poole's no fool. And he shows up. He accepts a proposal. He shows up. And when the Irishmen show up for the fight, Poole is there really with an army of thugs. And they beat Morrissey for 15 minutes. We're talking about dozens of guys. The fact that it was questionable Irish luck that saved him. A squad of Tammany reinforcers, realizing how dumb it was to go there, they show up and they save his life. Remarkably, Morrissey is up on his feet within a month. So this guy's a punching bag. So February 24, 1855, Morrissey is in the Stanwix pool hall. Uh, he's meeting with Mac, king of the newsboys, McGuire. Newsboys were in Chicago, New York, they were... Uh, to get the newspapers out they employed, they gave them, they, they were out commission, actually, my gosh, hundreds of kids uh, to dole out these papers. And the kids of them were used by punks like McGuire for other reasons. But anyway, who walks in? Big Pool, Bill Pool, and he's alone. So Morrissey, he, he just, he can't believe his incredible luck. He stands up, strolls over the pool, pulls a Colt revolver out of his coat pocket, points it right on Poole's temple, he squeezes the trigger three times. Nothing happens. The gun's jammed. Or it was empty, one of the two. Poole can't believe it's his own luck. He pulls out a revolver, points it at Morrissey, and then Morrissey does what most other people do in that situation. He fell to his knees, he screamed, he begged for his life. So Poole's about to shoot him when Mac McGuire says, you can't shoot an unarmed man. Well, Poole, as I said, was the smarter of the two. He considered the fact that Tammany control the police departments, they control the courts, worse yet, they control the jails, they control the juries. Uh, so he decided what he'd do instead of just shooting him dead is he'd make a self-protection case. He walks over, in those days, saloons had free lunch, you can get a sandwich. So he walks over, he picks up two butcher knives, his favorite weapon, and he hands one to Morrissey. Morrissey stands up and he's going to die. There's no way he can outfight pool with a knife, right? So just at that moment, again, he's saved by the bell. Several Tammany regulars, they show up, and they beat Poole pretty much senseless. But he, two policemen then come in, and they break it up, and they, they tell Poole to go home. Poole does. He comes back a while later, and he's armed to the teeth. He's alone, but he's armed to the teeth. So he's standing in the middle of the room, He's got a gun drawn. One of Morrissey's men, this young man named Lou Baker, walked up to Poole, spit in his face, pulled out a cult, stepped back, and then accidentally shot himself in the arm. 
But as Baker fell to the floor in pain from shooting himself, he let off a shot into Poole's leg and dropped him to the floor. Both of these guys picked themselves up. Baker gets his gun. Uh, he stood up first. And he pistol whips Poole back down to his knees. And then he fired a shot into his stomach and his upper chest. Uh, a fight at the end. Poole somehow manages to hang on for two weeks. The newspapers cover every inch of this. You know, how we, every day there's reports that uh, he's still alive, he's in pain. Anyway, he finally dies at home. He's surrounded by his boys and John Law. John Law sees this is a gold mine. i got to remind you that newspapers were a proliferation of newspapers in New York. The little town I came from, they had in the old days, they had two newspapers, morning version and night version. So they, he really pushed this story. You could pay. Newspapers in those days were really yellow sheet. And he could, most of them, he paid publishers, you know, print this story. And they did. So Poole, as a result, he causes a lot more problems in death than he did in life for Tammany. So supposedly his last words were, goodbye, boys, I die in America. That becomes a rallying cry for know-nothings across the United States. So they have an elaborate, super patriotic funeral for him. Um, he's sent to his grave. He's a thug now. Remember, he's sent to his grave in, in, in something, in a ceremony they usually preserve for reserved for heads of state, you know. So 5,000 mourners follow this black draped carriage, and they walk silently behind Big Pool's coffin. It's draped in the American flag, of course. They cross over the East River uh, to the Greenwood Cemetery, the mob cemetery where all the big bosses are buried. There's six full bands. They're all playing the national anthem. Uh, the, the other bands are dotted along. Root, they're joining in with the National Anthem thing. John Law is at the head of this massive parade. And behind him are 60 groups of know-nothing societies. Billy Patton, who had the leader, was the leader of a 10,000-strong Order of the American Star. F.C. Wagner had the Arch Grand Sacrum of Arch Chancery of the Secret Order of Americans. Wow. And next to him sat Senator Tom Whitney. Uh, there was a flag above all of this, showing a hand strangling uh, the neck of the American people by, by Roman Catholicism. Uh, and then behind them, there was the uh, James W. Uh, Barker's gang. He was the king of the know-nothings, and he showed up with hundreds and hundreds of guys. Thousands lined the streets, you know, so uh, they're all in their regalia and so forth. Here's some of the gangs that showed up. The Atlantic Five Guards. The Five Pointers, the Black Snakes, the Tigers, the Roughskins, the Rednecks, the Thunderbolts, Gladiators, and Bolts, the Little Fellows, the Rip Raps, the Rip Saws, the Screw Bolts, the Screw Boats, the Stay Lates, the Hard Timers, the Dips, the Plug Uglies, and of course the Blood Tubs. Yep. Yeah, you can't have a good time without a Blood Tub. So the spirit of Bill, Big Bill Poole, now, it's, it went on long after this guy's dead. And there are actually plays written about him, but he's much improved in his plays. Uh, and they always end with the same thing. He's holding his heart. He's still right there on the spot. He doesn't drag on for days. He says, boys, I die a true American. Well, you know, Poole, uh, now Lou, ba Lou Baker, in the meantime, the guy who actually shot him, he, he, he didn't know what to do. He's scared to death. Tammany can't help him. He gets on a ship to go to, I don't know why, the Canary Islands of all place. Well, John Law hears about this. Remember, John Law owns hundreds and hundreds of ships. He goes to the police. He says, I'll give you a cruiser. You can have it for the police department. Go get Baker. And they did. So they chase him, and they caught up with him about 100 miles before west of the Canary Islands. They haul Baker back to New York. He stands trial. But now Tammany can help him because they own everybody. You know, courts of them. And he's found not guilty. John Morrissey retired from New York City while later, he's a big hero in the Irish American community because somehow it came to be that he killed Poole. <clears throat> and he's known as the guy who faced down the know nothings, who were really hated in the Irish American community. So he's got 700 grand on him that he got from owning the casinos. And, you know, extortion. He continued to be a criminal 
you know, the whole time he owned these casinos and so forth. And he did the boxing and everything. He moves to Saratoga Springs. That was a big place back then, it was an up and coming thing. And he opens his really first rate gambling uh, casino. And he worked, you know, to improve himself. He wore better clothes. He wore expensive jewelry. He was known for sparklers that men wore in those days on the front of his shirts. He became very good friends with Vanderbilt, who hated law, so back the Irishman. And Vanderbilt showed him how to work the stock exchange, so he became even richer. He became the, coast, the toast of the state's cultural and business elite, but he remained. He had a great love for horrors and for gambling. He never lost that. Um, a, he amassed and lost several fortune. Here's the remarkable part. He served two terms in the state Senate and, and, and two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. Can you imagine that? It's a guy that couldn't read and write. His nomination outraged the editors of the New York Tribune. They wrote the public decency and the dignity of the national legislature has seldom been so boldly outraged is in itself disgraceful enough to nominate this ex price fighter, but worse yet, someone who owes his soul to the Tammany machine. At the very end of his life in 1870, he died. He had a religious conversion. He went back to Catholicism, tried to change his dirty ways. He died holding the hand of his parish priest, uh, and he left an estate worth mine the value of $2 million, $2 million at that time. is tremendous. So 50 carriages took him to his grave in Troy, New York. 15,000 people turned out to see him off. And that, my friends, is the story of Old Smoke Morrissey. showed up, went to the church. What should we do, Father? He's like, you go to the bar, tell them I sent you, and they'll set you up with a job. And that was Tammany Hall, basically, in a nutshell. The church was the internet, bartender was the search engine, and whatever website <laughs> he sent you to, that was your job. And you didn't turn that. And they were all Irish Catholic jobs, of course. The fire department started in 1845. They said, we need guys that are willing to run into flames and drag souls out of the torments of hell, and then <laughs> sit around 12 of you and have supper together every night. <laughs> Like, I've seen that picture my whole life. I love to do it. <laughs> the police department started the same thing. They said, we need you to find people in the state of sin, drag them to a small dark room, smack them into confession <laughs> until they absolve themselves of punishment. And they're like, they just did that to me my whole life. I'll do that to people. <laughs> That's what people say. Why were all the New York cops Irish? Because the police academy was Catholic school. <laughs> and nobody likes to admit it, but a good cop should have the combination of the listening skills of a good bartender and the unpredictable violence of a nun. But like I said, I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to just do whatever I can for people. Like the world hunger thing, the USA for Africa. That's, isn't that great? You guys hear the song? Nice song, isn't it? Beautiful. I'm, uh, I'm like anybody else on the planet. I'm very moved by world hunger. I see the same commercials. Those little kids starving and very depressed. And, uh, you know, I watch these things on TV and I see those commercials and I look at it and I go, God, how cruel, you know. To see a little kid out there and I go, fuck, you know, I know the, uh, the film crew could give this kid a sandwich. <laughs> you know the kid's not out there, uh, you know, filming a letter from home with a Betamax, huh? You know, there's a director five feet away going, don't feed him yet! <laughs> Hungry. <laughs> but I'm not trying to make fun of world hunger. Matter of fact, I think I have the answer because I spend a lot of time working it out. And uh, if you want to stop world hunger, stop sending them food. Don't send these people another bite, folks. You want to send them something? You want to help? Send them U-Hauls. Send them U-Hauls, some luggage, and send them a guy out there that goes, hey, you know, we've been driving out here every day with your food for like the last, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And we were driving out here today across the desert, and it occurred to us there wouldn't be world hunger if you people would live where the food is! <laughs> in desert! Understand that? You live in a fucking desert! Nothing grows out here! Nothing's gonna grow out here! You see this? Huh? Sis? This is sand! Yeah! It's sand! You know it's gonna be 100 years from now, huh? It's